beloved brothers and sisters, if we were to speak about the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it would be impossible for us to cover every aspect of the lives of every one of them, yet every one of them was a hero. And one thing that we learn definitely from the lives of the companions that is a consolation to us is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges you based on the ending, not based on the beginning, nor based on what happened in the middle. That's a very important point because all the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one thing that was very, very clear about their lives was the way it ended and not the way it started. The way it started became irrelevant. And for all of us, for all of us, every one of us, it is a sign of great hope because we may have started in the wrong way. In their case, they started off as non-Muslims, all of them, without a single exception, because there was no nubuwa or prophethood that had come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They started off as mushrikeen in a lot of cases. They used to worship idols and so many other things. And they, were, they used to consume alcohol. They used to do a lot in terms of oppression of others of the opposite sex, whoever it was and whatever it was. But as time passed, when the message came to them, some of them, it affected them immediately. Now, let's put it into today's context with us, for example. We see people who are not Muslim. We see people perhaps who are far from Islam, enemies of Islam. How do we look at them? Look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum for a moment and tell yourself some of the best of the Sahaba were some of the greatest enemies of Islam at one stage. So this should instill within us a certain amount of hope, not only within ourselves, for ourselves, but even for those who are the main enemies of Islam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He wants, He will open those doors wider than any of the doors open to you and I. So this is why when we see the enemies of Islam, it is a mistake to make a dua of destruction alone. But rather, we should say, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, guide them, soften their hearts, open their hearts towards Islam. If they want to harm us, protect us, and stop them in whatever way you feel fit. If you are not going to guide them, then you deal with them in the best possible way so that we are protected from their harm. Look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and this is something amazing. I'm going to give you a few examples where when they started off, they started off on a very bad footing. And as time passed, some of them came immediately. When, when the message came, some came immediately, just like us. Some of us are Muslims. But we are not taking our deen seriously. We don't take salah seriously, halal, haram. We don't take it seriously. Sometimes some of us, when we hear a message from Allah and His Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we turn quite quickly. Whereas others take a while. Don't lose hope. Each one will come at his time. Each one will come at his time. But don't delay regarding yourself because you don't know how long you're going to stay alive. So when it comes to others, we cannot shove down their throats certain things, nor can we guide them or issue the guidance because it's not in our hands. But we can, we can guide them in the sense that not perhaps make them walk on the path, but let them know what is right and what is wrong. Because there are definitely two types of guidance that are spoken about in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One is to show a person the way. That is also called guidance. And the other is to make them walk on the path. That is only for Allah. It's also called guidance. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a guide to the straight path. وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Indeed, you are a guide to the straight path. But Allah says, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ You will not be able to guide whomsoever you wish. The two guidances are different. One is to show the path. Yes, he was showing the path. Whether or not they walk on the path, that's now in the hands of Allah. We come to the masjid, we hear a message. Do you know what Allah says? Kill 
keep reminding for indeed that type of reminder that is constant benefits those who truly believe. So this is why you hear wa aqimu salata wa atu zakata in the Quran so many times. You hear it in so many hadith. Every time you come to the masjid, you say this imam is repeating the same thing. Correct, but not necessarily exactly the same wording. But the message is always the same: to obey Allah's instruction, to go away from His prohibitions. One day it will affect you just like it has affected others before you, and one day it will affect others just like it affected you, by the help of Allah. So the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, they never gave up hope even in the battlefield. A man like Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira radiyallahu anhu, if you take a look at him, there was a skirmish that happened and the battle of Uhud that took place and the amount of damage that was caused by Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu anhu at the time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not give up on the man. What did he do? He kept making dua. Yes, they were defending themselves from his harm. But they kept making dua. Oh Allah, soften this man's heart. Oh Allah, bring him to the deen. Oh Allah, a man like Khalid, so intelligent, cannot be oblivious of the fact that Islam is the correct religion. He cannot be ignorant of that. He's so intelligent. So Allah brought him along. And I want to give you another example of the fact that the end is what matters and not the beginning. Always, innamal a'malu bil khawatim. Your deeds are judged based on how you ended, how it was ending. Subhanallah. You know, you decide you're going to read salah, you start off and halfway through you break it and you're gone. What is that? That's not a complete salah. But if you decide to read salah, read salah when you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, now you're talking. Now you've tried to do something. Alhamdulillah. May Allah make it easy for us. So, if you look at the beginning, the Prophet ﷺ, he was in Mecca with his companions. They started accepting, some were persecuted. Some of those who persecuted some others later on accepted Islam. So both of them entered into the mercy of Allah. And there is a hadith which speaks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazed at those whom they are fighting each other, but both of them are ultimately going to go into Jannah. Like Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, he murdered some of the Muslims but later on he became a Muslim and one of the conditions he said I hope that I'm forgiven for what I've done and the Prophet ﷺ told him Ya Khalid Inna al-Islam yajubbu ma qabla O Khalid Islam the minute you accept it it deletes everything that happened in the past so now he started a new slate and inshallah he will also be perhaps from amongst those in Jannah for those with, with us may Allah grant us Jannah you know, the perhaps was more for us than for them because for them they were Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But for us, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us Jannah. So then there came the, the, the persecution of Mecca to the degree that they had to leave their homes. Think for a moment the challenges we have in our lives. I don't think in the case of a lot of us seated here today, we've been driven out of our homes. Yes, that has happened to others across the globe. They've been driven out of their homes. Only Allah knows how long they will be in a land or on a land that is not actually their homeland. It is happening. Those who are across the globe in war zones, etc. But is it a sign of the anger of Allah or the fact that Allah has a plan for them? It's definitely the latter. How do we know this? Because it happened to Muhammad sallallahu when he was driven out of his home in from Makkah to Mukarramah and they arrived in Medina Munawwara. They had no idea how long it was going to take or whether it was going to be everlasting or whatever. But what they knew is Allah was their Lord. He would provide for them. They had yaqeen and conviction that Allah is the Lord. He is going to provide. So as a result of this conviction, you know what? Allah tested that conviction. And with, you know, this is dedicated to those who are really suffering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Our brothers and sisters, be they in Syria or Afghanistan or Yemen, wherever they may be across the globe, the places are too many to mention. But wherever they've been driven out, comfort to them is that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Mecca, he was quite sad. But he knew that Allah had a plan. And he knew that this plan was going to end with a victory. He knew it. Subhanallah. He knew it. The plan was going to end with a victory. But for a mo for in the meantime, we had struggles. What were the struggles? They took our wealth. They took our properties. They 
drove us out, not just ourselves, but whoever. After that, they came to where we went. You see, two things happened. When they went to Abyssinia, Quraysh sent a group to Abyssinia to follow them to say, no, we don't even want them to have peace somewhere else. What was hurting them? You wanted us to go, we went away. Now you're coming to the new place also to cause a problem, subhanallah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy was such, they found a just ruler. Where there is justice, there is hope. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us hope and grant us justice. Amen. So later on when they went to Medina Munawara, again the mushrikeen made an army to fight them. Look, it's not enough that you're gone. We're going to come where you went. And you know when we're not going to just send a little delegation this time. We're going to bring an army and fight you. Subhanallah. They brought one army, another army. You know the battles that took place. The first one, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions decided rightfully that you know all our wealth that they took, everything that they took, they have gathered it and they sent for a business caravan to Asham. And when they went to Asham, the money that was used for those caravans, in today's words, we would use the word containers. You know, the containers that were now being brought from Asham, that money was ours. So we need to go and get it back. A small group of people, 330 men, they decided, let's go. They didn't even have proper weaponry, etc. They went and when they met Abu Sufyan, it was in a totally different place. The path had changed. The days had changed. They had called for, for, for backup. In fact, they didn't even meet the same people. They met more and others who came from Mecca to Mukarrama. Some had left and the others came through. Muslimin 313. The mushrikeen more than three times that number. Subhanallah. But Allah wanted something to happen. What was it? Allah says, we will give you a taste of victory today. We are going to give you a taste. These people are harassing you. They are troubling you. They have come to harm you. They took your wealth. They, they did whatever. They followed you to Habasha, to Abyssinia. And then you, you, now when you went to Medina, Munawara, they are following you there. And now what's happening, they are fighting you. We are going to make sure that you taste a bit of victory. What happened? The battle of Badr, they won. They won, the Muslimin won against all odds. And they went back to Medina, Munawara victorious. The, the mushriks had suffered a defeat. But guess what? It was not the end. Because the enemy still exists. There needs to be a solution. How is it going to come? I don't know. When is it going to come? We don't know. But it's going to come. Because we have conviction in Allah. Yaqeen. That yaqeen will drive you. Whether it takes one year or ten years. The end will definitely be the decisive one. Like we said, everything is judged based on the ending, not on the beginning. In the middle, you might sway this way, that way. So then they went again. When they went again, the battle of Uhud, the Muslimin suffered quite a bit of defeat. They suffered quite a bit there. There was not a decisive victory for either party, but there was a lot of loss in the part of the Muslimin because of the non-following of the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ. What happened as a result? Let me let you know. As a result of that, the yaqeen of the mu'mineen became stronger because they knew if we follow this instruction of the messenger, we will win. When we didn't, that's why we lost. So they became strong, powerful. They knew we are not wrong, we are right. And we are following the Prophet ﷺ and we will follow him to the T. You know, Subhanallah. The Sahaba anhum used to ask, like Umar ibn Khattab, it's reported that once he asked the Prophet ﷺ, are we not on the straight path? He says, yes, we are. Subhanallah. So some of the weaker companions followed up by asking, so how, how is it that we are not, we are struggling? He says, subhanallah, the victory is for Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, victory is for Allah. We have to do what Allah wants us to do. And the day will come when we will see that victory indeed. And that's why thereafter there was another battle known as the battle of Khandaq again. The, the kuffar were chased away by the forces of Allah and the armies that they could not see but they could feel. Allah says it clearly in the Quran, Anzala Junudan Lam Tarawha, that Allah sent down armies that they didn't see. You couldn't see. And then the wind came in. What else came in? The weather. And they drove these people back to Makkah to Mukarrama. They lost. They lost. 
But still there was no long-term solution. You know, when there is an enemy at a distance and you manage to throw a few stones, for example, at the lion and the lion goes away, but you're still in the same forest, you're worried it might come back, right? There has to do, something has to happen for that lion to be gone for good, unless it becomes tame, subhanallah. So what happened? They then decided at a certain point, let's go for Umrah. Allahu Akbar. Look at the noble decision of the Prophet ﷺ, inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taking his companions, we want to go and do ibadah. This is Baytullah al-Haram, it's the house of Allah, it belongs neither you, neither to you nor to me, it belongs to Allah. We want to go there, we want to worship Allah without hindrance. That's what we want, no hindrance. So what happened? They went, when they went there, they were not allowed. Now imagine the Nabi of Allah is not allowed. But look at the broader picture. That was the beginning of the victory. Subhanallah. He wasn't allowed. What happened? You're not allowed to come in here. Then there was rumor that the man who they sent to speak to the other party was actually murdered. That was a rumor. But it resulted in something even better. What was it? We became stronger. Our yaqeen became more powerful. That's the lesson. Conviction. Is Allah not your Lord? Yes, He is. Wallahi, I swear by Allah who has raised the seven heavens, He will help you. There's no ways that He can let you down. Impossible for that to happen. Even when Nubuwa came to the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija bint Khawailid anha told him that you are such a good man, you fulfill the rights of the, of the needy, the orphans, the poor, you look after this and you do so much of good, never can you be let down by Allah. You know what were the words? Kalla, wallahi la Allahu abadan. Never. Allah will definitely not let you down. I swear by Allah. Subhanallah. He will never betray you or let you down. How can Allah do that? So what happened thereafter? They did not allow them to make the Umrah. They said, no, go back. So they struck a treaty and I'd like you to look at that treaty inshallah at some stage. Maybe if Allah gives us the opportunity, we should go through one or two of the points and see what happened because wallahi it brings about lots of comfort to the heart. Everything that looked so negative was actually the key to the doors of victory. That's what it was. It looked so negative, but it was the key to the door of victory. Allah opened the doors. They said, take this out. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, that's not fair. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, take it out. They said, right, change this. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, that's not fair. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, change it. And so many things like this happened. It definitely seemed like it was a loss. They, they wanted to go back in a disgruntled way, but there were verses revealed by Allah. At the point of the dip of the low, imagine you and I go to Makkah and we're not allowed to enter. How will your return journey be? Tell me. I don't think we've even thought of it. How will your return journey be? It will be the saddest journey ever, ever. But the Prophet ﷺ was given verses. <speaking in Hebrew> Indeed, we have granted you a clear victory. How is it a victory? Asked some of the Sahaba. How is this a victory? Is it a victory? It is indeed a victory. If Allah is saying it's a victory, it's a victory. How? I don't know. You don't know. But let's wait and see. So they struck a deal. There was a peace deal between the two parties. And people were, you know, uh, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were, were quite saddened, some of them, initially. Because they wanted to ask a question, what is happening here? We gave up. We were supposed to make our umrah. We didn't. We're going back without anything. We didn't gain anything. So... As time passed, they remained steadfast. They continued to worship Allah. They spent every moment they had to spread the deen far and wide. So much so that during that short period of time, they had spread the message of Islam to the east and the west and all over because it gave them a chance. That peace gave them an opportunity to grow. So they grew. And they had now a following from all over, subhanallah, far and wide. And Islam grew much bigger than what it was at the time of that treaty. So the peace was needed in order to ensure the growth. And it grew. 
when it grew, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine plan had it such that these people would break the treaty resulting in the Muslims declaring that our treaty is over because you breached it. We have an agreement. You breached it. When you breach it, it's no longer on our side valid because it's broken. Not from us, from you. When that happened, the Prophet ﷺ prepared all the men, thousands of men. They marched on to Makkah. Nice, beautiful, reading their talbiyas and whatever else they might have been. And they just marched on to Makkah. And they marched in such a way that there was no way that that enemy would ever rear its ugly head again. Never. Because it's over. The story is over. They knew it too. Because when Abu Sufyan met the Prophet ﷺ outside Makkah, he knew, hey, I'm the leader of Quraysh. We've been hassling these people for a long, long time. Two decades, subhanallah. 20 years from Nubuwa and a bit more. We've been hassling them. And this was the most beloved unto Allah with the, his companions who were the highest after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they hassled them for how many years? 20. What did they do to them? Everything you can think of, they did it. And at the end, Abu Sufyan decided, you know what? It's time to accept Islam. It's time to submit and surrender. To who? Rabbul Alameen. He said, yes, it's the truth. It reminds me of something else. Fir'aun, right at the end, he was a wealthy man, powerful man. He had lots of money, lots of authority. Right at the end, he says, I am believing that there is none worthy of worship besides the God of Banu Israel. Which means not me, he used to call himself a god. But Allah, right at the end, he also had to admit it was a little bit too late. But in the case of Abu Sufyan and the others, and the Prophet ﷺ made peace in such a way that it was known as Fath, Makkah. Look at how it ended. All the trouble, the turmoil, the turbulence, the harm, the fighting, the killing was forgotten, completely forgiven, completely and totally wiped out besides being written as a record of history for every one of us to learn from that. That's why today we are talking about it. So the, the moral of this entire lesson today was, don't lose hope. Build your conviction, victories for Allah. It will come and it is coming, but it will take time. And conviction is something that is really needed. You need to have yaqeen. You need to keep growing. Don't stop. If you pause, you lose. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum did not pause. Wallahi, a day will come when the victory will be dished out by Allah. And it will be so clean and so clear that it will be seen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. In whatever little ways, each one of us may be struggling. Remember, after the darkest hour, there will always be daybreak. No matter what you are going through in your small world, for you, it's a big issue. For me, it's a big issue. But in comparison to what I just mentioned about the companions, our problems are minute. They are small. Yet, victory came to them. Do you think that Allah cannot give it to us? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. May Allah grant us ease and goodness. What a powerful lesson we learn from the dedication of the companions of the Prophet What a great Subhanallah, moment it must have been when the victory came and the Prophet ﷺ told them, Idhabu fa antumu tulaqa. We don't want to talk about what happened in the past. Let's move. You guys can all go. You are forgiven. You are free. Move. Subhanallah. Just by that gesture, a lot of them accepted Islam. A lot of them accepted Islam. And guess what? The Prophet ﷺ decided, and I'm going to end on this note. He said, Yes, we were born in Makkah. It is indeed the place of our forefathers. But I will return to Medina. Subhanallah. I will return to Medina Munawwara. It became more beloved to him than his own city of birth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and victory in our